Rail has some important advantages over road transport. A single train driver can move 5,000 tons of freight, or more than 1,000 passengers, the equivalent of 125 heavy trucks, 16 buses, or 500 private cars. Because of the lower rolling resistance of the steel wheel on the steel rail, each road vehicle consumes three times as much energy to move the same payload. This low rolling resistance gives rail another advantage, the train's ability to coast for long distances with the power shut off. All this adds up to a big energy saving advantage over our competitors. The consumption of energy in any form means the depletion of the world's precious and all too exhaustible natural resources at ever accelerating rates. We also produce pollution, poisoning the land, the water, even the air we breathe, creating serious ecological problems for future generations. In this age of environmental awareness, the railway can and must take full advantage of its inherent superiority over its principal competitor, road transport. This doesn't mean, however, that the railway can afford to be complacent. The LT and S alone consumes more than 63,000 pounds in electrical energy every week. As train drivers, how does this concern us? We have to run the trains to time, often in difficult circumstances, like during the peak. Sure but you can make a very significant contribution. Let's begin by looking at some basic principles. The energy you consume to run your train begins as energy locked in a fossil fuel, coal, oil, or natural gas. This energy is released in the form of heat in the power station's furnaces. The heat energy is transmitted as superheated steam to the turbine alternator sets, where it's converted into electrical energy. In this form, it's distributed via the national grid to the meters, the substations, and finally, to the overhead line. The train uses this electrical energy to drive its traction motors. As the train accelerates, the energy is once again converted, this time to kinetic energy, the momentum of the mass of the moving train. Finally, when you apply the brake, the energy is converted back to heat energy at the wheels. It's here that the energy is lost, being dissipated into the atmosphere. OK, so much for the physics lesson. I got that. But what do I actually do to conserve this energy? Remember what we said about low rolling resistance of the steel wheel on the steel rail? Well, quite simply, run your train with the power controller open for the minimum necessary to keep time. Let the train coast. Put another way, only convert the minimum amount of electrical energy into kinetic energy so that the train will coast to the next stop. Then you can brake later, losing less energy in the form of heat at the brakes. There's another advantage in this, a sort of byproduct less wear and tear on the brake blocks or pads, and less contamination from brake block dust. What you're talking about here is just good train handling technique. That's right, the driver's skill. Let's have a look at this in detail, beginning with stopping trains. Between each station, a coasting board will be provided at the line side, a white diamond. The sighting of this coasting board is carefully calculated for the characteristics of train performance and line profile. When driving a stopping train, you can shut off power at this board and have full confidence that the train will coast to the next braking point, keeping booked time and using the minimum energy. Let's take an example and see how this works in practice.
from Leon C to Chalkwell is one and a quarter miles. In normal rail conditions, our driver starts away selecting notch four on the power controller, making full use of the maximum acceleration of the train. The coasting board is reached at a little over half a mile from Leon C. Power is shut off, the train speed is 45 miles an hour. The train now coasts for about half a mile, at which point a service brake application is made, bringing the train to a smooth stop in Chalkwell platform. The working timetable allows two and a half minutes for this journey, our train has taken two and a half minutes. Now let's ask our driver to ignore the coasting board and maintain power. At three quarters of a mile, he shuts off. The train speed has risen to 55 miles an hour. He must now brake much earlier in order to make his stop in Chalkwell platform. When he does stop, we can see that he's gained 14 seconds on the book time. Handling the train this way has wasted energy and achieved nothing. In fact, it's cost an extra 30% in energy to arrive these few seconds early. Remember that. Gradients have a big impact on energy consumption. Now gravity becomes a factor. Adding to the train's momentum when the gradient is falling, subtracting from it when the gradient is rising. This is why knowledge of the gradients is a vital part of the driver's route learning for all types of train. Let's take another example. Again, the stations are situated one and a quarter miles apart, but this time the track is rising on a gradient of one in 100. The coasting board is now located at just over three quarters of a mile, so power must be consumed for longer to overcome the effects of gravity. However, even in these circumstances, our driver is still able to coast for more than one third of the total distance between stops and still maintain the book time. In our last example, the stations are once again one and a quarter miles apart, but the gradient is falling at one in 100. The coasting board is now only a quarter of a mile from the platform. After power is shut off, the speed of the train continues to rise. Aided by gravity, sufficient energy is stored in the form of the train's momentum to run nearly one mile to the next stop and still keep the book time. Timetables are carefully compiled to take account of distance, maximum permitted speed, train performance, and gradients. So far, so good. 
But I've come across coasting boards that seem, well, frankly, incredible. Take the down road between West Ornan and Lane. I reckon if I shut off at the coasting board, well, we'll be down at pretty near walking speed by the time I reach Langdon. OK, we'll try it. I'll bet you'll be surprised. And he was. The train was still running at 40 miles an hour when we made our brake application. And the arrival at Langdon was bang on time. See what I mean about the low rolling resistance of the steel wheel on the steel rail? It's where railways really score in this energy conscious age. It's up to all of us to make the most of this big advantage over our competitors. These coasting boards are all very well for stopping trains, but what about fast train running? Well, here's where your skill and knowledge of the route and its gradients really comes into its own. As you know, a fast train running from London to Benfleet in a book time of 33 minutes can maintain this timing with power shut off for almost half the entire distance. The best train handling technique for fast train running is to maintain constant speed, uphill and downdale. To do this, you need only sufficient power to keep the speed steady. Use notches two or three to reduce energy consumption where full power isn't necessary. Use your skill to keep power consumption to the minimum needed to run your train to time. Match power setting to demand so that the train runs at constant speed. Use the passing times shown in the working timetable. Running before time not only wastes energy, it disrupts traffic regulation. It can cause actual delay to other trains. What you've told us so far suggests that all electric multiple unit trains handle in the same way. But that's not strictly true, is it? No, for a start, some of older stocks, like the Class 308, are heavier and have a slightly slower rate of acceleration than more modern units. Then again, all the older stocks, up to and including the Class 312, use tapping contactors between the power supply and the traction motors. These transformer taps are cut out progressively and automatically in notch 2, half voltage, and again in notch 3, full field. In order to achieve the most economical rate of acceleration, it's necessary to notch out the tap contacts as quickly as wheel rail adhesion permits. This means that on a normal dry rail and where conditions allow, your train should be started by moving the power controller as quickly as possible to notch 4. In this position, the taps will be cut out more rapidly than in notches 2 or 3, again saving energy. When you need to ease power with this type of equipment, it's necessary to move the power controller all the way back to the off position. Then reselect the chosen notch. Don't, however, run the train in notch one. This is a shunt position. The latest generation of electrical multiple unit train is quite different. It uses thyristors in place of the old-fashioned tapping contacts. Your driving technique for this type of train is both different and simpler. The power controller may be placed in any of the four positions according to the power you demand. When easing power to maintain consistency of speed, it's not necessary to shut off and reselect. Simply move the power handle back to the required position. These modern trains are more energy efficient than the older units. Such modern technology enables you to use your experience, skill and route knowledge to obtain even better energy conservation results. What 
What about run under cautionary signals? Double yellows. Something we're doing all the time in the peak periods. Here's something we've all experienced when driving our car in fairly heavy traffic. There's always some fool stuck right up your tailpipe, purging to get by. He hasn't got a minute to lose. So you pull over. And away he goes, foot to the floor. Half a mile down the road, there he is, stuck at the lights, and he doesn't want to look at you. He's gained nothing in terms of time at the expense of greater fuel consumption and greater wear and tear to his car, to say nothing of his nerves. The same sort of thing applies when driving a train under cautionary signals. You know the traffic is dense, ease your speed, let the train coast. Try to match your speed to that of the train in front. That way, you won't be brought to a stand at a signal, and you won't have to consume a lot of extra energy restarting. There's another little bonus to be had by good, energy-conscious train handling. It has to do with customer satisfaction. A train that runs smoothly at a constant speed gives a much better ride than one which is alternately accelerating then braking. Spare a thought for your customers. They chose to ride with you, rather than by bus, coach, or more likely, their own cars. Trains that run before time don't satisfy customers either. While you're hanging about at stations waiting for time, they're getting anxious, thinking something's gone wrong. Let's take another look at some of the big pluses of good train handling technique. First, our industry, like any other, has to stand on its own feet financially and to exploit and maximize its inherent advantages in the marketplace. A 5% saving on Network Southeast fuel bill would put an extra three million pounds in the kitty in one year. Or buy a brand new train like this. Drivers who keep the train on time and use their experience and professional judgment to consume the minimum amount of energy are thanked in a very special way. Hundreds of drivers have now been presented with skill coasting awards to acknowledge their efforts. Um, likewise, Walter, um, on behalf of Peter Field, our divisional director, Mike Hector is my train crew manager, Bill Barrett, the deputy manager here, who also is the man who uh, first brought this to my attention. Um, thank you very much. Pass the word out, Walter, to the uninitiated. Keep up the good work, and uh, let's see how big a chunk we can chop off our traction current bill and what we can do for the environment uh, in the next couple of years. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thanks very much. much. Well done. Second, we can give a better service to our customers, more comfortable journeys, and less wear and tear on trains and staff alike. Third, by developing the sophisticated skills necessary to drive trains with precision, today's train driver can gain complete job satisfaction, taking pride in his vital role in a progressive industry with a challenging future. Lastly, we can play a leading part in the industry's contribution to reducing the global problems associated with depletion of the world's natural resources and the pollution and poisoning of our environment. The electric railway is the transport of the future. It's clean, it's quiet, and above all, it's energy efficient. It's up to all of us to make the most of it. Remember the advantage of the steel wheel on the steel rail. Makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs>